but John Aaron died. Then Robert, then Ned. So ended their glorious revolution. And Westeros has been burning ever since. Met Queen Cersei Targaryen. In some ways, it's already played out in the books, and in some ways, it has already played out in the show. And there may be more Med Queen Cersei Targaryen to come in the books and the show alike, especially if Cersei finds out that she's a dragon and she decides to burn them all in hopes that she will rise again, be born as a dragon. There are two ways to look at Med Queen Cersei Targaryen. There are parallels between Cersei and Med King Aerys in terms of their thoughts, their actions, and the way that other characters such as Jaime view them. And there are clues within George R. R. Mountain's canon that suggest that Cersei may actually be the bastard child of Med King Aerys II Targaryen. If the latter is true, then the parallels between Cersei and the Mad King take on new meaning. Let's start with those parallels, specifically wildfire and paranoia. As a child, Tywin thought about marrying Jaime to Liza Tully. Liza had been a pretty girl in truth, dimpled and delicate with long auburn hair. Timid though, prone to tongue-tied silences and fits of giggles with none of Cersei's fire. That's a very early comparison of Cersei to fire. If it were anyone else outside those gates, I might have hoped for a private audience, but this is Stannis Baratheon. I'd have a better chance of seducing his horse. During the Battle of the Blackwater, Sansa thought of Cersei's eyes as eyes of wildfire. Did you set him free? And when Cersei snuck up to Jaime as he stood vigil for Lord Tywin, the candles danced in the green pools of her eyes. Another nod to wildfire. When Cersei watched wildfire burn the Tower of the Hand, a scene that's only in the books, Cersei had been beautiful to look upon. One hand upon her breast, her lips parted, her green eyes shining. She's crying, Jaime had realized, but... Whether it was from grief or ecstasy, he could not have said. The sight had filled him with disquiet, reminding him of Ares Targaryen and the way a burning would arouse him. So now George R. R. Mountain is not only connecting Cersei to fire and wildfire, but directly connecting Cersei to the Mad King. And when Cersei says that it would be a lesson to their enemies, Jaime responds, Now you sound like Ares. During the last years of his reign, Ares and his wife, Queen Rhaella, they slept apart and did their best to avoid each other during the waking hours. But Ares would go sleep with Queen Rayla every time he gave a man to the flames. Burning people literally turned on the Mad King. He loved to watch people burn. With their skin blackened, blistered, and melted off their bones. And we see the same with Cersei. I killed your high sparrow. All his filthy soldiers. Because it felt good to watch them burn. In the books, Jamie saw the same wild lust in Cersei's sinister smile as she imagined taking out Sir Bronn of the Blackwater. Her sinister smile reminded Jamie of the time that Mad King said, Let him be the king over charred bones and cooked meat. Let him be the king of ashes. And the show gave this to us as well. Cersei poisoned Tyene so that her mother could watch her die. It's pretty messed up. Do you remember what the very next scene was? Do 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 do, cat on the prowl. Yeah, this happened. So just like the Mad King, Cersei is literally turned on by the pain and suffering of others. She is a sick and twisted lady, as evidenced by her thoughts towards the moth in the books. Die, the queen thought at it in irritation. Fly into the flame and be done with it. Part of what has driven Cersei to this mental state is paranoia, just like the Mad King. Arrows and traitors everywhere. Cersei was paranoid of nearly everyone from her own Kingsguard, to Sir Ellen Payne, to the High Septon. The High Septon's behavior was corrosive, as was his attitude. Having a man like that reside in the Sept eats away at the faith from the inside. So now he resides in the Red Keep dungeons instead. To the Tyrells. The Tyrells are a problem. Marjorie, because Cersei thought that Marjorie was the younger, more beautiful queen from Maggie the Frog's prophecy. We're going to be sisters soon. We should be friends. If you ever call me sister again, I'll have you strangled in your sleep. And Mace, since he was the male head of the Tyrell household. How do we pay them? Well, House Tyrell could front the gold and the, the crown would pay us back in time or I'd have words with my daughter. But in time, Cersei realized that the Queen of Thorns, Olena Tyrell, 
She was twice as clever as Lord Puffish, thinking, I will see you dead, old woman. And in the show, Cersei did just so. Get some rest, dear. You look appalling. Let me deal with Cersei Lannister. Put the pen down, dear. We both know you're not writing anything. Ah, yes. The famously tart-tongued Queen of Thorns. And the famous tart Queen Cersei. As for your veil threats. What veil? Cersei was even paranoid about people like Grandmaster Pycelle and her own kin, Lord Tywin's brother, Sir Kevin Lannister. Two men with proven loyalty to House Lannister. Of learning. My little brother had you sent to the Black Cells when you annoyed him. What do you think I could do to you if you annoyed me? I never meant to annoy anyone. But you are. You annoy me right now. You would abandon your king in his time of need. If he wants to send for me, I will be waiting for him. At Casterly Rock. Surely your Uncle Kevin could muster a force. My Uncle Kevin has all the courage of a kitchen mouse. As Jamie put it, more than once, Cersei, listen to yourself. You are seeing dwarves in every shadow and making foes of friends. Uncle Kevin is not your enemy. I am not your enemy. This paranoia is reminiscent of Mad King Ares. When Ares came to power, he dismissed the entire court and replaced them. Cersei attempted to do the same. I did not return to the capital to serve as your puppet, to watch you stack the small council with sycophants. Ares blamed all his wife's stillbirths, miscarriages, and dead princes on his wife, saying she was unfaithful, that the gods would not suffer a bastard to sit the Iron Throne. And he dismissed Western men from his service for no better cause than the suspicion that they might be Hand's men or Tywin Lannister's men. The captain of my personal guard, Sir Ellen Payne, was once overheard making offhand comments. It was Tywin who was really running the country. When the king was given this information, he had Ellen Payne's tongue ripped out with hot pincers. And Cersei thought about doing the same to Lady Merryweather. In 274 AC, Ares had another boy, and he seemed to be restored to his old self once again. But Prince Jaehaerys died later that same year, plunging Ares into despair. First, he blamed the babe's wet nurse and had her beheaded. Then he changed his mind and he blamed one of his own mistresses, torturing her and all of her kin. I'm ready to meet the gods. What? Today? You're not going to die today. You're not going to die for quite a while. Shame! <laughs> Ares had his king's guard stand over his second son, Viserys, night and day, to see that no one touched the boy without the king's leave. Even the queen herself was forbidden to be alone with the infant. When his wife's milk dried up, Ares had his own food taster suckle at the teats of the prince's wet nurse to ascertain that the woman had not smeared poison on her nipples. And the mad king piled up all the gifts they had received for Viserys' birth, and he burned them, for fear that some of them might have been ensorcelled or cursed. Ares' paranoia regarding Viserys is similar to Cersei's with Tommen. How many king's guards are posted outside Tommen's door? St. Boris is on duty tonight. Tomorrow, I believe. So yeah. one. I want four men at Tommen's door, day and night. Then the defiance of Duskendale happened. Long lives Sir Barristan the Badass. But captivity at Duskendale had shattered whatever sanity had remained to Ares the Second Targaryen. He no longer let anyone touch him, including his servants. So his hair went uncut, his body unwashed, his fingernails lengthened and thickened into grotesque yellow talons. Convinced he had enemies all around him, he wouldn't allow blades in his presence, save for those of his king's guard. Ares refused to leave the Red Keep, a virtual prisoner in his own castle, and he began to question his own son and heir, Prince Rhaegar. At this point, Ares hired Varys, the spider, who would crouch at the king's side, whispering in his ear, which did not help any with the king's descent into madness. He became obsessed with fire. First, he tried to hatch dragon eggs, to no avail. Then he turned to the wisdom of the ancient guild of alchemists, the pyromancers. It was rumored he had developed an obsession with wildfire, a substance which, once lit, cannot be extinguished, and was known to inflict horrific punishments on those he considered enemies burning men alive so he could pretend to be a dragon. Lord Rickard demanded a trial by combat. Ares declared fire the champion of House Targaryen. And as we said earlier, Ares seemed to take great pleasure in these fiery executions. Pleasure not unlike Cersei's own. It felt good to imagine their shock and their pain. 
No thought has ever given me greater joy. Arius was too afraid to attend Rhaegar's wedding, which was just across the city at the Great Sept of Baelor. In fact, Arius only left the Red Keep one time after the Defiance of Duskendale. That one time was four years later, when he attended the Great Tourney at Harrenhal. When he returned to King's Landing after the tourney, cold winds hammered the city, so King Ares II charged his pyromancers with driving the winter off with their magics. Huge green fires burned along the walls of the Red Keep for a moon's turn. And in the end, Mad King Ares appointed Wisdom Rosart, a pyromancer, as his final hand of the king. So Ares loved fire, just like Cersei. He was turned on by killing, just like Cersei. And he was so paranoid that he questioned everyone including his own kin, just like Cersei. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. What qualifications can he possibly have for this post? The qualification of loyalty, Grand Maester. That's far more than the eunuch ever had. Far more than many ever have. The small council grows smaller and smaller. Not small enough. Do you think it's wise, Your Grace? Arresting the heir to Highgarden. The Faith arrested the heir to Highgarden. No, we cannot make you leave. And you cannot make us stay. Their paranoia led them to burn all their bridges. So in their times of need, no one is there for them. Save Kyburn. So what does this all tell us? A few things. Cersei mistakenly thinks that Marjorie is the younger, more beautiful queen from Maggie the Frog's prophecy. So in the show, Cersei blows up the Great Sept of Baelor. In doing so, she takes out Marjorie and many others whom Cersei had looked at as her enemies. But in the books, Cersei already used wildfire in a controlled burn to take down the Tower of the Hand after Tyrion had killed Tywin. Will Cersei blow up the Great Sept of Baelor in the books? Or has Cersei's wildfire subplot already played out? There's a clue in the books. If we go back to the scene where Jaime and Cersei make love in the Great Sept of Baelor, they knocked over some candles. As Jamie bent to pick them up, he thinks, fortunately, they had all gone out when they fell. If the sept had caught fire, I might have never noticed. That will probably turn out to be an easter egg. Cersei's gonna blow up the great sept of Baelor in the books, just as she's done in the show. Number two, the endgame. Cersei's paranoid, just like Ares. She gets turned on by death and by fire, and she's burnt all of her bridges. Ares was left with his pyromancer hand, Wisdom Rosart, and Cersei is left with Kyburn, who may be an amalgamation of Kyburn and Helene in the books, since Cersei once told Jaime that maybe she'd appoint Pyromancer Helene as her hand. Take that for what it's worth. But the point is, Cersei has backed herself into a corner, just like Mad King Ares. Got them all, he said. She has only left the Red Keep one time, and she hates everyone. They're about to become a million more soldiers in the army of the dead. I imagine for most of them it would be an improvement. Every time we deal with an enemy, we create two more. Your brother's gone, the High Sparrow, sort of that. The rest of your family have abandoned you. The people despise you. Then I suppose it will go on for quite a long time. This is a dangerous situation. You're surrounded by enemies, thousands of them. You're going to kill them all by yourself? Remember, Cersei's sinister smile when she thought about killing Bronn. That smile reminded Jaime of the Mad King how he was determined to let Robert be the King of Ashes. So don't be surprised if Cersei feels that her only choice is to burn them all. Especially if Cersei finds out that she's got the dragon's blood. Over there in that urn, the ashes of Arian Targaryen, Arian Brightflame, they call them. He thought drinking wildfire would turn him into a dragon. <laughs> he was wrong. If Cersei finds out that she's a dragon, she may think the exact same thing that Mad King Ares once thought. That she would burn with them all, but that she would rise again, reborn as a dragon, turn his enemies to ash. So, is Cersei the Mad King's bastard daughter? Yes, she is. You'll find the best clues in the Jaime Targaryen video, but I'll share two in this video. Number one, the Aureus Baratheon clue. You should be the hand of the king. Two times. Cersei asked Jaime to be Hand of the King, and he denied her both times. The first time starts with Cersei saying, We are as heirs, Jaime. You must take father's place as Hand. Jaime denies her, quote, A hand without a hand? Bad Jeep, sister. That's a known I could do without. The days are too long, the lives are too short. This line is very similar to another alleged Targaryen bastard, or at least 
a half Targaryen, or is Baratheon, the first Baratheon, quote, The king's hand should have a hand. I will not have men speaking about the king's stump. And remember, this little passage began with, We are his heirs, Jamie. So it's a nice little touch by Sir George R. R. Martin. Subtle clues. The second of today's two minor clues is similar. Quote, Jamie's sister liked to think of herself as Lord Tywin with teeth. Did it ever occur to you that I might be the one who deserves your confidence and your trust? Not your sons, not Jamie or Tyrion, but me. But she was wrong. Their father had been as relentless and implacable as a glacier, where Cersei was all wildfire. At face value, that's saying, Cersei's temperament is different than Lord Tywin's. Tywin was as relentless and implacable as a glacier, whereas Cersei was all wildfire. I didn't trust your father. I didn't particularly like him, but I respected him. He was no fool. He understood that sometimes we must work with our rivals rather than destroy them. But y'all know how George R. R. Martin rolls, how he plays with words. That line may have a hidden meaning. Marjorie will dig her claws in, you will dig your claws in, and you'll fight over him like beasts until you rip him apart. I will burn our house to the ground before I let that happen. They blame us for the death of Oberyn and his sister and every other tragedy that's befallen their cursed country. I will burn their cities to the ground if they touch her. Cersei liked to think of herself as Lord Tywin with teats, but she was wrong, because Tywin is not her biological father. Cersei was all wildfire. Cersei is the Mad King with teats. Jamie Targaryen coming soon. Hit subscribe. I would burn cities to the ground. You are all that matters.